Tonight on NJTV News, cracking down on boundary hoppers, parents who lie about living in towns with better schools than theirs to give their kids a better education tax-free. A gold star ceremony to honor those killed in combat or taken prisoner or missing in action in our nation's wars and to honor their mothers. And hungry for art? We'll call through an exhibit you can sink your teeth into. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Wells Fargo. Together we'll go far. And by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at NJRealtor.com. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us. New Jersey created even more jobs than we first reported. The Labor Department's figures show we actually gained 13,800 private sector jobs in August alone. That combined with low unemployment should be a boon to business, but business leaders tell lawmakers too much stands in their way. David Cruz reports. Although the latest job numbers suggest New Jersey's business climate is showing signs of life, there is still anxiety among the state's business leaders, and this so-called summit was intended to bring business and government together to try and figure out how to get the simmer to a boil. The main areas of concern are taxes, they're too high, regulations, there are too many, workforce readiness, there's not enough, and transportation and infrastructure. It's all falling apart. We have not created any new revenue for our infrastructure since 1988. You know, costs have, in, has, have increased, um, uh, uh, labor rates have gone up, material rates have gone up, right of way to buy property, to build your, your transportation systems have gone up, yet we've had not an increase in, in revenue there. This is a great conference. We've heard a lot of great things on these panels, but a lot of things that we've talked about today, and I'm sure tomorrow, we've talked about last year, the year before, and the year before that. In panel after panel, participants agreed that growth is essential, but that without the help of government, the process will continue to be too slow. So it was at today's panel of legislative leaders that business people expected to get some answers and perhaps some hope. What they got was New Jersey's special brand of legislative bipartisanship. But, you know, I mean, it's not that easy. It's I, I, I never got to the education, education answer because that we was might be able to have a panel right here because I, I, I think we're I finally think starting to see exactly why there is gridlock in Trenton and why nothing I, ever gets done. Think, we're going to stand here and bicker all afternoon. I'll just step back and you I, guys I, go. I, I, you can nibble around the edges all you want. You can have a 10% program. You can have all kinds of incentive programs. But if nobody's here, no one's going to take advantage of that. So I tell you, it is time to change the legislature, despite the fact that personally, I love these guys. The infrastructure has to get fixed. And we have to address, whether it's a sales tax, whether it's a gas tax, it is going to be a tax. But what you can do is constitutionally write a question so tight that it so can't go for maintenance, that it can't go for operation, that every single penny goes for the purpose that it's being raised. If we cannot listen to each other and brainstorm the problem, we will never get to a point of understanding the symptom of the illness of the state. That's the way the legislature works, but it's a messy business. It's making sausage. You expect that. But what you do hope and expect is that at the end of the day, you will have a sausage. At the end of today's rowdy session, Chamber CEO Tom Bracken asked the four leaders if they would commit to an ongoing dialogue with the chamber on its big four issues. They said they would, and Bracken said he would be calling them first thing in the morning on Monday, telling us later that that made the whole conference worthwhile. In Atlantic City, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Down on the boardwalk, the long-shuttered showboat casino finally has a buyer. Stockton University has sold it to developer Bart Blatstein for $22 million. Stockton bought the property last year for $18 million, planning to transform it into a satellite campus. But deed restrictions and legal wrangling ensued, and a judge ruled last month the university could sell it off. 
at Montclair State University, the first ever statewide summit on autism spectrum disorder and the progress of critical basic research into its cause, Brianna Venosi reports. A broader definition of autism, it's a change researchers agree was needed. These individuals with autism have many, many different reasons why they have this common final pathway of developmental issues and behavioral problems. And these doctors and families want to know why. This statewide summit on the autism spectrum disorder held at Montclair State University brought together some of the state's leading minds to present the latest research. The problem with autism is that you can make a diagnosis of autism without regard to what causes it from a biological perspective. So our research is really trying to understand the biological causes and contributions to autism spectrum disorders. Genetic sequences and DNA patterns were a big topic today. Researchers say they found that the features of autism share many genetic similarities with other neurological disorders. If we approach the behaviors more as a neurological disorder, then the treatments might be totally different. In 2014, when the Centers for Disease Control issued their report, they found that nationally the prevalence rates for autism were 1 in 88. In New Jersey, uh, the prevalence there were 1 in 45, and for boys in New Jersey, 1 in 29. Gerard Costa with the state's Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health, which hosted the event, says the future lies in getting to the root cause instead of treating symptoms. It's really not focusing just on altering behavior. It's on really focusing on understanding each child's unique profile. New Jersey has given about $35 million in grants to fund autism research projects. One focused on possible links between autism and certain plastics used in everyday items that touch foods. Dr. Yvette Genvier's work focused on better screening of children in minority neighborhoods. The folks in those communities have told us they have trouble with the questionnaire type formats that are currently available for autism screening. So I created a tool that's pictures looking at some of the typical red flags for early autism. A common school of thought over New Jersey's high rate of autism has linked it with our successful early detection, but the research presented here shows that theory may not stand on its own. I actually think that, that what we call autism, however it used to be called, has changed, has grown. Families who must stay ever vigilant on the topic say even with medical advances, a diagnosis is daunting. Their quest for the best resources, never ending. As he changes, you have to shift the supports and services that you're getting now, uh, meaning throughout their life. It gives you a little bit of hope in terms of um, you know, what's going on in the laboratory could eventually then be used to maybe benefit my son, or if it can't benefit my son, maybe another family and another child won't have to develop autism. In Montclair, I'm Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Split decision for Borgata employees and appeals courts ruled personal appearance standards are lawful, how they're enforced, well, that's another story. That tops tonight's Garden State Express, our first stop, Atlantic City, where every Borgata babe knows the deal. When they took their jobs as cocktail servers, they agreed to wear suggestive outfits and not gain or lose more than 7% of their body weight. 21 servers went to court charging discrimination. The court ruled Borgata Borgata didn't discriminate, but it could be held liable for damages in 11 claims of sexual harassment for the way the rules were enforced. One plaintiff's attorney telling us supervisors allegedly were allowed to ask those who'd gained a bit if they were pregnant or just fat and allowed co-workers to snort like pigs at them. Next to New Brunswick, where one of the Rutgers football players swept up in the home invasion ring arrests was back in court pleading with the judge to lower his half a million dollar bail. Starting cornerback Andre Boggs was cut from the team after being arraigned on charges of armed robbery. His family can't post property bond because they live in Pennsylvania. The judge told them to go back there and raise the money. Finally, Montclair saying goodbye to a powerhouse in the fight for LGBT rights. With the big battles for marriage equality and bullying prevention behind her, Garden State Equality's Executive Director Andrea Andy Bowen has resigned to focus on economic justice issues closer to home in Brooklyn. GSC says it's stronger and more stable for her leadership. Bowen says Garden State Equality's most exciting work is ahead of it.
And that's our Garden State Express for Friday, September 18th. Something up in your town? Tip us off. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The best free public school districts in the state, those with small classes, high SAT scores, and nearly 100% graduation rates, don't come cheap. Parents in towns like Montclair and Milburn and Ridgewood pay high tuition in the form of high property taxes. Increasingly, parents from poorer districts are faking residency in those towns to give their kids a better chance. It's called boundary hopping, and in at least seven states and the District of Columbia, it's a criminal offense. Michael Hill reports. Woodland Park has made it clear this welcome mat is not for everyone. Anyone wishing to be heard on this ordinance the ordinance would give the school board the authority to penalize parents or guardians of ineligible school enrollees or border or district hoppers with a $2,000 fine on top of thousands of dollars in restitution. Yes. Yes. A united front with a unanimous vote that follows in the footsteps of other New Jersey towns. Woodland Park's new ordinance is meant to have a chilling effect beyond the family that breaks the residency rules by taking aim and punishing those who would aid and abet. And then there's also an up to $2,000 fine for anybody who lends their address or domicile um, where the student is not actually living, but that address is used to register the student within the school district. We're sending a message not to do this here. The mayor says it costs more than $20,000 a year to educate one high school student here and more than $16,000 for elementary school. He says last year, Woodland Park removed 19 non-resident students from its schools. It's very high. We need to ensure that we're educating the children who belong to be here. Superintendent Michelle Polari helped the council draft the new law. Is that tough for you? In these situations? It is. It's very, it's very, very difficult because the children form relationships with other children. They have relationships with the teachers. And you don't want to see them go. But at the end of the day, they don't have a choice. And they're there because of decisions that the adults have made. Stealing education, as some call it, is a big deal. So some New Jersey school boards require residency affidavits for registration. Others, like Milburn, this year are requiring everyone to prove they live in the district. Some districts offer rewards for tips. Some get private investigator Jimmy Messis a freehold to audit the whole district using his databases. What I'm looking for is just what address appears to be the most used address by that parent. And that usually tells me where the parent lives. Woodland Park has assigned a police officer to handle its school residency investigations that can include hours of watching and documenting where children sleep at night. This is all about creating deterrence for people to do this. Um, quite frankly, the taxpayers of Woodland Park only need to pay for the students that we're required to educate who live in our town. A theme found in countless coveted districts where outside parents risk embarrassment and more for a shot at a better education. In Woodland Park, Michael Hill, NJTV News. For today's NJTV News question, we're asking whether you'd fake your address to send your child to a better school. Share your thoughts with us on our Facebook page or tweet us. No, if I was the individual that's in that town paying taxes, because it's not fair. No, I don't think so, because I live in a good area anyway. I'm definitely, if I have to lie a little, I have to lie a little. I don't think the school really matter, like for the edu education. If they try hard, then I think it would be fine. A little white lie and I can get my kid to go to a better school, I would do it. I don't think it's right, but if I have to, I will.
Governor Christie's proclaimed this the day we pause to honor America's war dead and those taken prisoner or missing in action. The New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Foundation led a remembrance at the Vietnam Memorial and also recognized our Gold Star mothers whose kids were lost in combat. Lauren Wonko heard their stories. He was a West Point graduate who loved the outdoors, football, family, and his country. Nearly 10 years ago, Captain James Gerbis was killed in Iraq. Jim had just turned 25. He was 25 in September of 2005, and he was killed um, November 5th. It was a roadside IED. The Eatontown resident was killed while trying to help a fellow soldier. One of the things I think you'll find out about Gold Star moms were this put it, drew us all together. We come from many walks of life, but this is the common denominator for all of us. Today, Gold Star Mothers were recognized during a wreath laying ceremony at the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Homedale, along with prisoners of war and those missing in action. The importance of it is because people forget. Nobody recognizes that there might be, and there possibly is, uh, prisoners of war still out there, especially from Af Iraq and Afghanistan, even possibly from Vietnam and missing in action. The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency indicates as of September 3rd, more than 83,000 Americans remain missing from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the Gulf Wars, and other conflicts. A lot of these people, these, these uh, siblings or even parents, I know, would, would not know what happened to them, um, you know, and, and it's, it, it is, you never get closure. Helen and her husband, Ken, a Vietnam veteran, are grateful for their closure. Well, I actually uh, sent three officers to the house, and as soon as I opened the door, when they knocked on the door, I, I, I instantly knew what it was, and I just, like, my knees almost buckled. And Ken hopes today's ceremony and the New Jersey Gold Star Family Monument, which will be unveiled at the Vietnam Era Museum and Educational Center next weekend, will remind all Americans of the sacrifices our service members make. Although our current uh, military is not a draft, but less than 1% of our population, they're there not for the pay. They're there because they love their country and they want to keep you safe. And that's what Jim was doing. He was keeping us safe. Jim's legacy lives on, not only in their hearts. The Gerbis family created a nonprofit for at risk youth in Jim's name. Tomorrow, they're taking more than two dozen kids to a West Point football game. What do you want people to remember most about your son? He had a love of country, and we're very proud of what he was doing, and he was doing what he wanted to do. So, although it's a terrible loss, and he was our only son, he he was defending his country. In Homedale, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. Behind landmark projects, the George Washington Bridge, New York Second Avenue Subway, the revitalization of Newark, is a group that studies the proposal's impact on poverty rates and crime, safe streets, sustainability, the strength of power grids and old underground pipes, along with local governments and their debt loads. That big picture is the focus of the Regional Plan Association, which produces a comprehensive proposal every 30 years and is about to publish its fourth in 90 years. Its president is Tom Wright. Thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Your plans got to include the Gateway Tunnel under the Hudson. What does Governor Christie's and Cuomo's letter to President Obama asking for half the money say to you about the prospects of finally getting this done? The prospects for this project have really improved over the last couple of days, and I think we're at an important moment for this. I, I should say the last plan that we did called for building that tunnel under the Hudson River. It also called for building the Second Avenue subway and connecting the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central. Those two projects are moving forward, but this is really the last project from the prior plan, and we're glad to see it moving now. How important is building a new rail tunnel to the whole region? Oh, it's it's. Uh, we had a, a forum in this spring where we had the deputy secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation. He said it's the biggest priority for the entire nation, and I think that's right. I think on infrastructure, this is the most important project for the entire United States. What are the main issues the fourth regional plan addresses beyond the tunnel? 
Well, when we put out our last plan, we talked about how scientists were starting to say that there was something about the the heat of the planet and potentially some concerns we ought to have. And of course, today um, we know that climate change is real and that sea level rise, and we're going to face uh, stronger storms and more floods, and uh, and our coastal communities have to be more resilient. So that's a big part of it. Technology has changed. Of course, we didn't have cell phones, let alone iPhones or or any of the technology that we have today. And so people's commutation patterns, the kinds of work people are doing have all changed. And so all of that's new too. Um, so we have these kinds of new issues, but there's still other issues like what do we, how do we help the communities that have been isolated, cut out from uh, economic opportunity? How do we break down barriers and segregation? How do we provide uh, opportunity and education to all of our children? And so those are issues that we've been fighting for over 50 years, 90 years. And that requires enlisting the local governments. Absolutely. So we work closely with state, local governments, and the federal government. But the interesting thing is we're a private organization. We're a think tank, a research-based advocacy group that thinks across political boundaries and thinks beyond political current terms of office. What is specific to New Jersey? Well, New Jersey in particular benefits, uh, I mean, I think it was Ben Franklin who famously said New Jersey was a keg tapped at both ends. We're a pass-through state, uh, and that's where our economy comes from and our, our proximity to Philadelphia and especially New York City. New York City is probably the most important and the fastest growing industry in New Jersey. And so our connections to New York have been critical. Likewise, New York City really benefits from New Jersey and the educated labor force and the opportunity to put back office operations and uh, logistics and other things here. So, so really kind of the connection between these two states and between New Jersey and New York City in particular are a key focus of the work we do. Okay, Tom Wright, thank you for being with us. It's really a pleasure to be here. Every parent knows the age at which children begin devouring literature. It coincides with teething. I'll let you munch on that. It's the age the book The Very Hungry Caterpillar becomes a staple. It's Eric Carle's best known work and along with many more it's on display at the Montclair Art Museum. Here's Maddie Orton with NJ Arts. His characters are painted, cut, collaged, and instantly recognizable. The man behind The Very Hungry Caterpillar is the subject of a very happy curator's new exhibit, Eric Carle Animals and Friends at the Montclair Art Museum. He is capable of telling a story in this very direct way that children understand, but at the same time adults are engaged by this unique blend of abstraction and representation and sophistication and simplicity. The show features artwork on loan from the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art in Massachusetts. It provides insight into how the 86-year-old author illustrator of over 80 books works. So you have not only the original tissue paper collages, but also other objects that show his creative process. Original pencil sketches, original book dummies and mock-ups. You really get a sense of how he evolves his ideas over a period of time. Visitors will also have a sense of how ideas have shaped him. At age six, Carl's parents moved from Syracuse to their homeland of Germany, and then war broke out. And it was during high school that he really became aware of the Nazis and especially their uh, policy of branding modern art as degenerate. Stavitsky says that as an art student in high school, his teacher showed him reproductions of works by artists like Matisse, Picasso, and Franz Marc, the pre-World War I German expressionist known for the yellow cow and blue horse. That was really the start of his creative vision, of his idea that you should have the freedom to paint a polka-dotted donkey or a yellow cow, blue horse. In fact, Carl paid tribute to Mark in his 2011 book, The Artist Who Painted a Blue Horse. He explains in this video. He's an artist who, whom I love and who has inspired me, and I hope the book will inspire you. The museum offers a room with tissue paper and other supplies for kids to try their hands at this style of visual art. A quote from Carl hangs on the wall as a reminder for these aspiring artists. There isn't any wrong color, and you don't have to stay within the lines. In art, you're supposed to be free. 
It's a philosophy that Carl continues to embrace with his latest book, The Nonsense Show. That we have to um, unleash our imaginations and, and you know, do what we want to. Of course, the exhibit wouldn't be complete without Eric Carl books. A reading nook tucked in the gallery houses a selection of family favorites. In Montclair, I'm Maddie Orton, NJTV News. Next week on NJTV News, encouraging towns to make affordable housing a priority and security preparations for the arrival of Pope Francis. I'm Mary Alice Williams for all the men and women of NJTV News. Thanks. Have a great weekend. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Whether it's your home or business, the New Jersey Association of Realtors works diligently to protect your interests as a property owner. We advocate for you on the issues that matter, here in Trenton and in your neighborhood. As a voice for real estate, the New Jersey Association of Realtors supports initiatives that maintain home ownership and foster thriving communities in the great garden state. More about us at njar.com.